How many of you have had the opportunity to visit their tables and um, get their books and maybe chat with them a little bit? I thank you so much for coming. And my first question is for you, Tish. Tell us about your first encounter with Elvis Presley. Oh, do we have, is it on? Is it on? Can't tell. Okay, well, I was a nurse, internal medicine cardiology for 50 years. And Elvis, back when the day when he bought the Circle G Ranch, when he bought the Circle G Ranch, well, he'd ridden the horses all day. You know, he bought six of everything. So at the end of the day, he had a problem. He had a sore butt. So he talked to uh, George Klein, who he'd gone to school with, and he says, George, I've got to have a doctor. I've got a sore butt. So at the time, George was dating a girl that was our receptionist, so he called Barbara. She made a poll in the clinic, and so Dr. Nicopolis said, well, I'll go see him. So he went to see him afterwards, took care of his sore butt. I don't know, several weeks after that, he had another issue. So the doctor told him, he said, well, you'll have to become an established patient. So he did. We closed the clinic after hours, of course, and he came in, and I was the D.O.N., so I was taking care of him. So we were in a room, and we were just chit-chatting, and I was checking his blood pressure and all this. So he was talking to me, but he was looking down at his knees. Now, I'm like 26 years old then, so I went over to him, and I pulled him up by his chin. I said, Elvis, if you talk to me, you look at me. So we go ahead and got through with everything. In a few minutes, they paged me to go to Dr. Nick's office. Fright, I thought. I'm fired. So I went around to his office and I knocked on the door and I said, you page me, sir? Yeah. Well, that didn't sound too good either. So he said, what did you say to Elvis? I told him, he said, he liked you. So that was music to my ears. So I took care of him in the office and then I would go to Graceland and take care of him. So I had two daughters and uh, of course he had Lisa that would come periodically. So I'd, after I'd get off from work, I'd go down and let the girls play with Lisa till nine o'clock. He kept wanting me to move into the, he said, I'll put you a double wide trailer in the backyard. We'd just built a home. I said, no, Elvis, no, not, not gonna do that. So we kept on, he kept on. So he goes behind my back and hires my husband to my way, okay. He hires my husband because he'd formerly been a police officer and was doing construction work. So he hired him to do security and to work on, the, uh, on Graceland on the place there. So that's how I'm at. he ended up getting us there, you know. My husband, I came home from work and he said he had a job and he was going, he was going to have to work, you know, he was going to have to move. And it, it was a big decision to make because I have to take the children out of school and out of their church, but it was the best decision we ever made. Very, very blessed. Let me tell you about Elvis Presley. There's not enough adjectives in the dictionary to describe the man. He was awesome in every way. I was so blessed. I was his nurse 5% of the time, 95% of the time we were friends. I have to tell you a cute story about him. I had a full-time job night before, eight, well, a couple of weeks before we'd go on tour, he'd sit there and eat a lot, and he'd think I could get 20 pounds off of him. So I told him, I said, now Elvis, when I get home from work tomorrow, we're gonna hit the, we'd walk six times around the driveway, and then we'd play racquetball. So I get home from work, I change clothes, I go up to Graceland, He's sitting in the baby's room watching TV with his robe on, eating biscuits, dripping with butter. So I go over and I took my life in my hands and I just did this in the biscuits. He just gave me that, you know, what kind of look. And so he, uh-huh. And so, so he gets up and he goes in the bathroom, he gets changed. Well, I was real quiet because I was rather mad. I had worked all day long and he'd been sitting up there. So we did all of our walking, we get on the racquetball court. Well, I was making him run. I was backhanding him. He's running from one side to the other. And all of a sudden, I hear this thud. I turned and looked, and yes, Elvis Presley was sitting back down on his butt on the floor. And I looked at him, and I said, Elvis, what the heck are you doing sitting down there? He looked right straight up at me, and he said, Tishina, that was my nickname. I just found out my balls don't bounce. <laughs> So he's already on the floor. I'm laughing so much. I'm down on the floor laughing. And I looked at him, I said, Elvis, I've just pee peed in my pants. Get out of here. It'll take the varnish off of my floor. So I told him a little while later, I said, you know, I can save you some money. I said, you don't need Jackie Cahane. 
I said, it would have taken a comedian months to think of what you said. And I said, you spit it out like you knew what you was doing. So you need to take Jackie's place sometime. But I was very blessed. He was just a wonderful, wonderful man. I'll tell you one more quick story about him, and then I'm sure Kay's ready for me to get out of here. We were going somewhere one night, and Elvis was, we drove really, really slow and went out the gate because there was always fans there. So he was always afraid somebody was going to get hurt. So we were going down the street, and there was this little black girl pushing her bicycle. So he stopped. He said, now you get out and tell her we'll take her home. I don't want to frighten her. So I got out and told the little girl. So we put, he got out. We put the bike in the trunk. We took her home, went up to the door, told the gentleman that came to the door. So then when we left, instead of turning to go like we were going to go, he turned the other way. And I said, well, did you change our mind on where we were going? He said, you'll see in a minute. So we drove all the way across from Whitehaven, all the way downtown Memphis to find a Western Auto. So he goes in and he buys this beautiful pink bicycle for this little girl. So we get in the car and we go back and we go down there. He said, now I'll go up to the door with you. So we both go up to the door. The man came to the door and he didn't say I'm Elvis Presley. He said, I'm Elvis and this is my friend Tish. We're the one that brought your little girl home. Is she still here? Yes, well, could I see her? So Elvis squatted down, the little girl came out. She was about eight or nine years old, cute little thing. And uh, he said, you know, I'm the one that brought you home. And she's shaking her little head. And uh, she said, he said, do you, honey, do you get an allowance? Yes, sir. And I don't know, five, ten cents. He said, tell you what I'll do. If you promise me you will save your money till you get enough to fix your bike and you will give it to one of your friends that doesn't have a bike, I've got a present for you. Oh, she unfolded. She was just the happiest little thing you've ever seen. Put this grin on her face. So we go out to the car and get this little girl her pink bicycle. And she was so excited and I was too. So then after we left, I thought, well, you know, you interrupted what we were gonna do. I said, Elvis, what, what made you decide to do that? He said, well, you know, I remember down in Tupelo, Mississippi, and I had a flat on my bike. And he said, it took me forever to get that home. And you know, the thing about Elvis Presley that I have to relate to, he did not want notoriety for that. There would be some people that would have to have all the TV's channels and all the newspaper out there. He didn't, he did it because he wanted to. He got gratification out of it, and it was the best thing to do. And he was just a good old Southern country boy. And that's why we all still, 45 years later, love him so much. Okay, her book is Taking Care of Elvis, and she did. <laughs> I have to tell you a little story about the book, and then I'll shut up. Of course, being there and with him as much as I was, for about four years after Elvis left us, the news media hunted me down like a hunting dog. I was not going to talk to him. He was my friend, and I just absolutely could not do it. So after about four years, I kind of backed off, and then I stayed in the Elvis closet for about 40 years. Be telling my age here in a minute, wanna. And this friend of mine, he kept wanting me to do he'd come to his event. So I said, okay, I'm gonna come to your event, but I'm gonna be the church mouse. And I was, but I had my eyes and ears opened up to the hunger in the fans, all you people, me included, who wanted to know about Elvis Presley, the person. Forget the sex, drugs, rock and roll, and women. They wanna know about the person, I thought. You know, you're 70 years old, you need to get off of your tush and take some notes. It was a very emotional journey, but it's a, one of the best things I've ever done. And I'm doing this because Elvis Presley would want me to. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, as fans, we thank you for doing that and for sharing stories. So um, if you haven't gotten the book, you can visit with Tish at her table. Oh. oh. She uh, is also a good friend of Elvis's jeweler, Lowell Hayes. So she has some of his jewelry that she... I have lots of Elvis's jewelry. It's made from Elvis's mold, either for Elvis or for gifts that he had given to people. Now, none of it's 14 karat gold because it's all gold filled and silver filled, but every bit of it is made from Elvis Presley's mold from Lowell Hayes. So come by my table and look, you might find some sparkle. I'm sure Elvis gave you things, right? Elvis gave me too much, too many things. He just, he just was the biggest giver that ever was. He was a terrible receiver. It embarrassed him for you to give him anything. But he just, you had to be careful if you said anything because you might get it. <laughs> well, I, I have a personal question. Can I ask you? 
So like, what did you get Elvis for Christmas? We know he loved Christmas, right? What did you buy Elvis Presley for Christmas? <laughs> you know, that was really, really difficult because here's a man who has everything, and if he doesn't have it, he can buy it, right? So my mother-in-law worked for Waldron Bookstore, so I got him a book one year. He loved to read, or I'll tell you Elvis' secrets. His eyes would get tired, and we would end up reading to him. He was spoiled, but that's okay. I loved every minute of it. So I got him a book one Christmas, and then after that, I got him books all the time because he told me, he said, you know, people send me these paintings and this thing that's numbered and that thing, and they spend all their money. He said, but these books, I can ingest them, and I can have them, and it's the best thing I can ever get. So, hey, I lucked up on that one. But, I, you know, when the drone came out, oh, I wish he'd have been here. He would have had a ball and driven us crazy. Thank you. Let's give her a hand. And we appreciate you so much coming all the way up here from, um, where, where you live in Olive Ranch, Mississippi, but very close to where Grace was, 12 miles from Graceland. But um, we appreciate you and Barry coming up to be with us and help out our athletes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Okay, so here's the deal with um, Sally's new book. I finally made it into an Elvis book. <laughs> it's official. You're in there. <laughs> so, um, Sally, we all loved your um, Destined to Die Young. How many people have read it? You know, this, this book makes us appreciate how much Elvis appreciated his fans and how much he loved to perform because we know from Sally's research that Elvis was, um, that it was a chore sometimes for him to be on stage, but he still wanted to give and he continued to. Oh, I love this. But <clears throat> her new one <clears throat> is, is about Ron Strauss, who was uh, one of the pilots for the Lisa Marie. And... Um, Tell me how you happened to get in. Yeah, I'll get to that this. in a second. Let me just, I wanted to say about Destined to Die Young, you know, Tish was such a big resource and such a huge help. And I wrote her a letter explaining the research I was doing, what I was working on, and, you know, I'm going to be in Memphis on these dates. Will you meet with me? And she said yes without hesitation and did that. And, you know, and she does it for fans around the world all the time. So thank you for meeting with me and now we're friends, so I value that so much. Uh, but what she says is true. She does it for the fans and she ultimately does it for Elvis. So it's, it's an amazing thing. Um, same thing with Ron. Uh, the new book is about Ron Strauss's life and he gives free talks about Elvis all the time. He doesn't take payment for it. And like you said, he does it so that people know who the real Elvis was. So it's really important to Ron because Elvis was so respectful to him and Elvis changed his life in big ways, especially career-wise, having flown for Elvis, you know, Ron says that opened up so many doors for him. So he does, he speaks about Elvis in the way that Tish does and for the same reasons. His life is very interesting. It's very, um, it's almost touching how devoted he was to become a pilot because he was fearful to start with that he didn't have the education to even become a pilot. So. Yeah, very untraditional route. So he grows up in rural Iowa. Fonda, Iowa is kind of his Tupelo. Very much like Elvis, Ron Strauss was not expected to be the most successful citizen that came out of his town, uh, but he was and certainly is the most famous. Um, he's kicked out of Catholic school in 10th grade. The priest calls him in and says, we don't think you're cut out for school. And Ron says, you know, they were right. I liked girls in football. So, <laughs> so he goes home and his parents are not happy, uh, but they do agree to sign for him to join the Air Force underage because he knows he loves airplanes. Now he believes he'll never be a pilot because he doesn't have the education for it, uh, but he can at least be around planes. So he starts as a mechanic, works his way up to flight engineer. He's in the Air Force for 12 years and uh, flies 3,400 hours during Vietnam. So then he, le yes, yeah, absolutely. So he leaves the Air Force though after 12 years because he realizes he can't be a pilot in the Air Force because of his lack of education, but he believes he can do just as good of a job as the other guys he sees flying. So he leaves the Air Force in order to achieve that dream, and he does. And then he is hijacked as a pilot in Nicaragua. He has to fly political prisoners to Cuba, which is an amazing story. And then he gets to fly Elvis Presley. So it's an incredible life story. It really is hard work and perseverance, and it's a little slice of Americana, really. 
really. Uh, uh, how, you, you've probably all been uh, through, through the Lisa Marie and seen how beautiful it was. And um, we were lucky enough when, um, before Graceland purchased it back to put on display, uh, it was being shown in different cities from the previous owners. And <clears throat> we, uh, my husband and I saw it the first time out in Las Vegas. And then when it came to Indianapolis, our fan club got to be the ones that helped man it. It was very cool. <laughs> yes, and it was, it was so great to get Kay's perspective on that because the airplane is so iconic and it's so connected to Elvis, right? We see it on Elvis Presley Boulevard. And for her as a fan to tell me the stories about how when that airplane would come into town, the fans knew Elvis was in town. And that airplane is very much like the pink Cadillac coming into town in the 1950s, Absolutely, right? Yeah, yeah. Very much so. So to get that, yeah. you know, to hear the stories of you waiting for the airplane and all of that, you know, that's, that's part of Ron's story too. Yeah, yeah. I know the first time that Paul and I went to the airport to see Elvis come in, and Paul made the comment, and I think that you put it in the book, Paul made the comment because the plane comes in at night, and when it touches down, the lights come on, the big TCB up on the tail, and, and Paul's standing there going like, oh yeah, here's Elvis sneaking into town. And nobody would guess that he's on that plane. <laughs> So the other cool thing that Ron allowed me to do, um, we're good friends, and I went down to Florida and spent a week, I uh, rented a house, took my family, and I'd go spend every morning with Ron interviewing and talking about his life, and then go be with the family in the afternoon, and then he'd come over and our families would have dinner together, and we, that was the first week of research on that book. Um, but one of the fun things that I was so looking forward to was sitting down with the Elvis Day by Day book and Ron's flight log. So one would connect the other, and give Ron That's awesome. context too, yeah. uh, but Ron allowed me to print his entire flight log from 1975 to 1977 as an appendix in this book. Mm -hmm. So that is a historical document tracing everywhere Elvis went pretty much <laughs> from 1975 to 1977. So that's in the Tell back of the book. Tell real quick about the, uh, what I told you was my favorite little story. Yeah, the famous story of, you know, everybody's always heard the story of how Elvis, they make it sound like he wakes up in the middle of the night, or I guess he's awake in the middle of the night, right? And he decides to go to Denver for the fool's gold sandwich. They call the pilots. We want to have a sandwich, we're going. And of course, it wasn't that simple. And Elvis is kind of always depicted as that glutton, which I think is really unfortunate. Uh, because the truth is, it was Lisa's eighth birthday. And yes, they had the conversations about the sandwich. And yes, Elvis wanted to go and get a sandwich. But then they also had to return Lisa to Priscilla in California. So they took the Lisa Marie, they stopped in Denver. They made arrangements where all these sandwiches would be brought on board, along with champagne and a birthday cake. And the, the guy at the the Colorado Mining Company made a special birthday cake for Lisa. So it was a birthday party on the airplane. And Ron tells that story because he had a piece of it and was able to eat the right. sandwich as well. But it was not just Elvis sitting on the airplane eating four big sandwiches all by himself, as has often been told. So it's so important to correct those things. Well, you know, Elvis, everybody thinks they know Elvis, and there's the iconic Elvis on stage, and then there's the kind of crazy Elvis that does nutty things, which that original story was. You know, oh my God, he took off in the middle of the night and flew all the way to Denver for a peanut butter sandwich. And here we find out that, you know, there was more to it. He was, it, the plane was new, it was special, it was beautiful. You know how beautiful it is. And he was gonna celebrate his daughter's birthday. Yeah, and in some ways it's easy to see, you know, from a research standpoint, it's just interesting how these things get traction, how they gain legs. And there is a video out there of Elwood David, who is the pilot of the, the other pilot of the Lisa Marie. And he says, yeah, we got this call at two in the morning to get the airplane ready because Elvis wanted a sandwich. So we had to fly out there and get a sandwich and it stops at that. You know, Elwood didn't include the information about Lisa's birthday, so you can see how that grows over time. Yeah. So um, let's give them both a round of applause. You know, we as Elvis fans appreciate knowing the people who knew Elvis the man. You know, we all know Elvis on stage and how perfect he is and his music is wonderful, but these stories that these ladies know is just a gift that you're giving back to us and we appreciate it so much. So thank you for being here.